Hello again, and welcome to the lesson 3 of my Unity programming course for beginners. Today we are going to make a memory game called Simon or Simon. We are going to learn about lists, loops, and quarantines today and see how we can use them in our game. So let's take a look at the game itself. We press start game button. And we have to repeat the sequence. You might have seen similar game in Among Us in Reactor Room. And once you fail, there is a fail sound and you can start over. So pretty straightforward. We can now start learning new concepts. So let's learn about lists. Lists are collections of things that you want to use and store together. You can use them to store all items that your factory produced in game or all factories that you have built or even all buildings together. In board games like chess you can store all board tiles in the tile list or all pieces of one player. In card games you can store deck, hand and discard as lists. That is what I do in my games that you can check out in my uh, devlog videos on the channel. Why do you want to store things together? Basically so it is easier to go through them and access them one by one or to apply some actions to all or some of them. You have 100 tiles, you don't want to create separate variable for them, for each. Uh, also lists are expandable, so you can start your game with 10 items in the list, then add another 20 during the game and remove 5. And you will still have references to everything you need. Look at it as some kind of a complex variable that stores many items instead of just one. So here is how we create list. So we have public because we want our list to be accessible everywhere, for example. Then we have the keyword list, which tells us that we want to create a list. And here we have our type, because lists are collections of one kind of things. In this case, we have list of ints, so the type, we're doing int. Another thing that you have to do is to initialize the list. You can do it immediately after declaration or you can do it for example in awake or start like this or like this keep in mind that if you initialize the list in awake and then in start it will still write into the same list so you will basically override that everything you, that you did before you have to initialize the list before the first use but also if you leave it un uninitialized and then in Unity Editor drag something into the list fields, it will also be initialized. Here are the most common things that you can do with the lists. For example, you can add a value to a list. Right now we have added value 5 to the list, so right now it consists of the value 5. We can do it again. So now the list consists value 5 two times. And now we have 5, 5 and 7 in the list. So that's how we fill the list with values. We can also remove things from the list. And one of the ways to do it is remove by index. Here you can see that we have values stored in some order and this order is indexed and the first value is 0 so the first 5 is at index 0, second 5 is at index 1 and third value 7 is at index 2. Let's say we want to remove the middle 5. To do that we have to call remove add and the index is 1. Now we have only 5 and 7 left in the list.
we can also clear the list completely so the list will be just empty another thing that we can do is to check how many things are in the list to do that we have to use dot count on our list right now i'm printing the count and the count will be zero because we have no values in our list if we do it here for example then the count will be two because we have two values at that point of time second thing that we should learn about today is loops loops are the commands which you use when you want to repeat something most common ones are while and for loops we use while loop when we are waiting for some condition in order to stop repeating stuff and we use for loop when we know how many times we go through the things for example when we want to repeat something exactly five times so let's say we have our cleared list of ints and we want to fill it with uh, numbers from 0 to 9 the way we do it is by using for loop here is the structure of our for loop first we declared our iterator which is just an integer starting with 0 then we declare the condition at which we still keep repeating stuff so in this case if our iterator is less than 10 then we keep repeating and then we increment our iterator so every time it runs it will increase this i so first time it will be 0 second time it will be 1 third time it will be 2 until it reaches 10 and when it is 10 it is actually not going to execute anything because 10 is not less than 10 it's equal to 10 and what we do here on every iteration of this loop we add the iterator value to this list so at the end we will have a list with 10 values will be digits from 0 to 9 So right now the count of our list is 10. We can use while loop to reduce it to 5. What we do here is checking condition from the beginning. If the count is bigger than 5, which is true for now, then we just remove the first element of this list. So for example, in the beginning we had list like this. After first iteration, we'll remove zero. After second, we'll remove one. Third, two, then three, then four. And we have five things left. The count is not bigger than five, it equals five. So it will just leave this loop after we have this kind of list. What you can also do, you can break out of the loop once you reached your condition. So for example, what we do here, we have our list 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We go through it in for loop by index. We start with index 0, which is 5, and we go up to index of a count. The count is 5, so 
up to index 4, which is 9. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Then we can access specific element of the list by its index. In this case, our index will be i. So every iteration of this loop, every step, every time it repeats it, we check the value of this i, which every time changes because on every step we increase it by 1. So first we check it with 0 and we check if it's equal to 7. Value is 5, it's not equal to 7. So we just continue. Then we check this number and then we check this number. And once we reach 7, it sees that 7 is equal to 7. That is how you check if something is equal to something. You have to write equal sign two times. And you put break into it, which will immediately break out of this loop and go to the next string after the loop. And last thing that I want to show you today from new material is coroutines. Coroutines you use when you want to basically wait for something or do some tasks in parallel or do some tasks in parallel. Here's how you create a coroutine. It's a function with a return type of i enumerator. Also, it expects you to return something. Here's how we return from a coroutine. What it does here, it returns waiting for seconds and it waits for one second. Yield means that we are waiting more or less until the next code is executed. So you can see here that this is second zero and it will print it out into the console, but then it will wait one second before it actually prints second one. You can also wait for other coroutines. So for example, if there would be another coroutine like move, I can say yield return start coroutine move. And it will wait until movement is done. This is how you actually call the coroutines. You do start coroutine and then put the coroutine as a function call after it in as a parameter. You can also return null, that means that it will wait for the next frame. But we will keep it consistent, so it will wait for one second, and second one will be printed after second zero in one second. So that's what we're gonna use today. Let's start our game. Let's create scripts folder. And we will create game manager script as we always do. Let's create game manager object, which is basically just empty game object and we will put our script on it. And let's go into the code. We will not need start or update here. Let's see what we need. We will need a list of integers to keep track of tasks for our player. So for example, there was a sequence red, red, blue, orange. We have to keep it somewhere. We will create player task list for it. And also we'll create player sequence list, which will keep current progress of a player. I will make them private because we don't really need to see them in the editor. We also want to play our sounds when the button gets clicked or when the tile gets previewed. So we'll create another list. At this time, it will be a list of audio clips. We have only four buttons, so each index will represent one of the buttons. Basically, we'll have list with four values, in this case, four audio clips. 
and at index 0 we have red, at index 1 we have orange, and the index 2 we have green, and then we have blue at index 3. Unity stores your audio files in audio clips. So if you want to use them, you have to create a reference to audio clip. That's what we did. We just put four references in one list. What we also want to do is to highlight the buttons that are being played right now. To do that, I will use list of lists. So list can handle as many lists inside as it needs to, and this lists inside it can handle as many lists they need to, etc. So you can basically stack lists forever. Here is how it looks like. So we can see we have a list, and this list is of type list, which is of type color32. So this list stores a lot of color32s, and this list stores a lot of lists of this type. Why color32? There is color and color32 available. Color32 holds values from 0 to 255 and color holds values from 0 to 1. I want to be able to use 0 to 255 because I basically went to Unity and picked the colors that I need in this format. We also want to have a reference to all the buttons that we have and let's take the reference to button component just for educational purposes. We have to uh, use unityengine.ui in order to access button component. We need a loose sound because if we lose, we play a different sound, which is the same for all the buttons. And we need an audio source because if you want to play some music or clips, you have to use some audio source in order to do it. Another thing that we need to do is to disable the buttons when the player can't press them. The easiest way to do it is by using canvas groups because it can basically disable everything below it in hierarchy just by triggering, uh, just by changing one boolean. And I think last thing that we need is a start button because we want to start the game and then restart it when we are ready, not just letting the game start it when it's ready. So, I think we have everything that we need listed. When you're developing your own game, you probably have to add some things, then go add something in editor, then go back and because you figured out that you need more stuff. That's normal, uh, but for the purpose of a tutorial, we just use what I already prepared. So we don't waste, waste time on the things that we don't need or or searching around for stuff that we need. So let's initialize our colors first. That's the first thing that we need to do. And lists of lists of colors won't be visible in editor. So we need to manually add everything from code. I have already prepared colors, so I will add them here. Here is how you add to the list of lists. So first we access our first list. Let's, let's call it first list. And we call add on it. And then we initialize a new list there of color32. And you can directly initialize values, starting values in it like this when you create it. This is the format that you use. And you can use it here inside or you can use it like outside to initialize some other list. Like here, we can do something like this. And this will be the list initialized with one, two, three. Here's the colors that I picked and the structure is like this. So first color 
is a regular state of the button. And second color is highlighted state of the button. First, second, first, second, first, second. And let's set our buttons. We'll have later added in editor. Right now we have them only in code. But let's set them with the normal colors first in awake. So we don't have some weird color issues. Here is a way to do it. And we will change the color not on the button, but on the image. We have access to our button components on each of the button. We can access each button by its index. We know that zero will be four, so I manually just put zero, one, two, three. And we get component from each one of them. We need to get component image and get color. And then we set the color to one of the colors from the list. For example, for the first button, which is red, we set the button color to our first list, which is this one. And the first value of this list, which is this one. For the second button, we will do second list, which is the list at index 1, so it's this one, and again, the first value. Same applies for two others. We can also use loop to do that. For example, for int i equals 0, i less than 4, i plus plus. What we do here, we copy this, paste it here, and change the values that are changing from 0 to 3 to i. Basically, here we have a transcription of what it will do every step. So at first step, i is equal to 0. So it will do clickable buttons 0, get component image color. And then button colors 0, 0. On the second turn, i will be equal to 1 because we incremented by 1 every time. Remember this i plus plus? It means i equals i plus 1. So the new value will be equal to old value plus 1. So when it's 1, this will be changed to 1, and this will be changed to 1. When it is 2, it will be changed to 2, and this will be changed to 2. So we don't need these parts anymore. We had everything nice in the list. And the good thing, if you have 100 values, for example, you can just do 100, and you're done. So you don't have to write it manually for 100 things. Let's uh, add some game logic. So every time we press a button, we should add index of a button that we used player sequence list how do we do that we create a function that's supposed to add the value we have to pass the value to the function so we add a parameter for it we are preparing it to be called from the button in the editor so every time player presses it will directly call this button so the first thing we will do, we will just directly add the index. So let's say player pressed red button, which will be button at index 0. What it will do, it will fill our list with 0. 
Every time we add a button, we need to check if player is still on track with repeating the previous sequence that was added randomly, more or less, or the player failed. Here we can use the loop. So we go through all the values that player has added during this turn. For example, he pressed button 0, button 1, and button 1. So we will go through this three times. And we need to check if the first button that player pressed was the first button that he had to press, which is stored in player task list, because we are trying to repeat the task. The way to do it is to check values at the same indexes of this list. So if player task list i equals to player sequence list i, what we do in this case, we just continue. Continue means jump to the next iteration. So don't do anything that is here, just jump and start the next iteration immediately. Because if these values are equal, that means that the player is correct. If they are not correct though, we would return, so we will not continue. Return returns from a function. So it will stop executing this function completely. We'll also print the message that player has lost the game, but we will change it for real losing sequence later. In case every single value in the player sequence is the same as the value in player task list, at least until the count of the player sequence list, because we are iterating only until this count, then we should check if what player clicked is the same size as what player had to click. And if it is, we have to start next round. So when player clicks the button, it will check if basically everything that player clicked this during this turn fits into our tasks. And if everything does, then we check if we actually have the same amount of clicks as we need to do for this task. If we do, then we start next round. If not, then we are waiting because we were waiting for player to click again until he actually does enough clicks. And if player clicks something wrong, then we just lose and never actually try to execute it because we are re returning. So what we do if player just starts? There is a button available for him to start the game. When he presses it, he basically has to start the next round and disable the button. Let's create a function for that. So we will attach it later to our start button and when you press that button it will execute start next round which we still have to write right now it just says in console when it executes it that okay we're starting but really does nothing and it deactivates the button so it doesn't block the view and let's move to our coroutines so let's start with starting of the next round So we create a coroutine, 
which is basically a function of type i enumerator. And you can see that it's red, so we'll just return uh, yield return now. If we leave it at the end, nothing bad will happen. It will just wait for next frame until it actually closes the coroutine. So we need this to put the delay in between the press of a button, for example, and starting of the next round. Or just in general, so you kind of have time to figure out that the next round started. We also have to clear the player sequence list because for the every next round you start from scratch. Your tasks grow, but the things that you actually clicked should be cleared. As we learned before, we can just clear the list by writing dot clear after it. We should also disable the buttons because if they are active, we can keep clicking and break our program because it will keep adding stuff when we don't need it. Remember, I was talking about canvas groups as the easiest way to disable everything under some hierarchy. We will later put uh, all the buttons under one game object with this canvas group and when we set its state to interactable or to non-interactable, it will enable everything below it or disable everything below it. And let's wait for one second. So when we press start button, for example, it doesn't start it immediately and you have some time for your eyes to prepare. When we start next round, we have to increase our task list by one new task. To do that, we have to add a random value from 0 to 3 to our task list. From 0 to 3 because we have only 4 buttons and each has an index 0, 1, 2 or 3. To add a random value to the list, you can use random.range and first value is inclusive and last value is exclusive. So even though it says from 0 to 4, it will be from 0 to 4 minus 1. And after wait time that we added one second, we can enable our buttons back. Now what we can do, we can actually start this card in, in start game and in add to player sequence list instead of just typing the text out. Here is how you do it. We have another function that we haven't implemented yet, which is losing for the player. So let's do that. We need to give player time for his loss, so 
he would probably wait for two seconds while he was he's losing. We need it also so the screen basically is uh, busy with the sound and showing you picture and not just immediately jumping to restart button. We want to play a loose sound when player loses, so let's do this. We have referenced our audio source that will be on one of our game objects in the scene and you should call play one shot on it if you want to play some sound which is more or less like an effect or a small sound or loops you usually prefer to have a separate audio source and just loop it somewhere but for this good enough and we have our audio clip which is loose sound we pass it to play one shot function when we want to play it. We have to clear the tasks and sequence that player clicked. Then we wait two seconds and we enable our start button again. That way player can just basically press the start button again and start the game again. There is one last thing that we want to do. We want to highlight button either when the program shows you the tiles that you have to click or when you click them yourself. So let's create another coroutine for highlighting the buttons. And at the same time, we will play the sound depending on the button you pressed or the buttons that you're going to highlight. We need to pass this function button ID because we need to know which button we're actually highlighting. We need to access the color of this button on its image and change it to the highlighted state and after some delay change it back. So to access our buttons we take the list that we have of our buttons and then do get component on it to get the image to change its color. What we did here, for example, it's button 0. It will take button 0, take its image component, and take its color, and assign it, assign it button 0 color, which is red, and highlighted state, which is at index 1. Also, I want to play a sound. So... Pretty similar to the clickable buttons, we have our sound stored per button, so by index you can access the sound that you actually need. We do the same as we did for loose sound, so audio source dot play one shot, then we access our sounds by the button ID. 
Let's wait for sound to play and for player to basically see that something was highlighted. Let's wait for half a second and let's basically and let's set the color back. We copy the previous thing because we do it for the same button and we just change the colors that we need. So first it was one, which is the index of highlighted color and zero is index of regular color. Let's change this message that we had for lost to actual lost coroutine. So we do start coroutine. Player lost. And we need to highlight the button. We need to highlight it when the player presses it. So here, And when we add the new button to the list of tasks, we would also prefer to highlight all the tasks. So once we edit it, let's go through the list. We can use we can use for each loop in this case, which basically will allow us to go through the whole list, no matter how many objects are there. So we don't have to specify, it will go through every element. This is how it's written. So we specify the value. This is how it goes. So you specify the name of the variable, which will represent the value that you take from the list. So for example, on the first iteration, it will be button one, so index one. On second iteration, it will be button three, so index three. It will basically take the values from this list, not the indexes, the values. And we want our list and we want our loop to wait until it highlights each button. As I told you, we can actually wait for coroutine to finish. This is what we're going to do here. We pass the index that we got here to the highlight button coroutine, which will then highlight the correct button for us, wait for half a second, and allow this loop to play through its next step, because we are waiting for this half a second here by calling yield on this coroutine. This is all the codes that we need for this game. So let's start building it in Unity. We can see our game manager has a lot of unassigned things. You can use it to actually build what you need. We know that we need a lot of UI elements, so we need a canvas. We need an object for a canvas group. We'll center it and I will call it buttons. So let's add UI buttons under it. 
have one button let's drag it under and make it four what we can use here is let's see our thing we can use So I dragged our game window so we can see it better. We can see that it's not what we actually need. We also want to change our canvas settings. So render mode is screen space camera. We drag our camera there and set the plane distance to one. So nothing is too big. Here is our canvas. We can Lay out our four buttons by doing layout group, in this case grid layout group. We edit this component and we select the cell size to be 300. We also want to align children middle center, so it's in the center of the screen. And we want to do fixed row count, so it's only two rows. Let's see how it actually looks in game view. That's pretty good. We don't need any of this text, so let's remove them. We want to set colors for these buttons, but we'll do it through the code. So don't do anything right now. We also want to have some black background we do that by adding the panel let's set the color to black and we have to move it on top of the buttons because the things that are on top they will be behind in UI We also want to add canvas group and as you can see there is interactable button so it's either disabled or enabled and we need a start button Let's set the size to 900 by 900 so it covers the whole area. And position to zero. Probably it's too big, let's do 600 by 600. So it's exactly the size of our button. Let's change the text. And change the size of the text to something big. All right. Last thing that we want to add is audio source, which we need to play sounds. So let's see what we can actually attach already. We can attach our audio source by dragging main camera to which we attached our audio source. We can drag buttons to canvas group because we attached canvas group there. We have our start button, which we can also drag to start button. And we have clickable buttons, which we can drag one by one, for example. I would also rename them to red, orange, green, and blue. Things that we are missing right now are sounds. I found some sounds in one of the packs that I bought. You can find just random sounds in the internet 
and it will also work. So I drag the sounds into my assets folder. Here they are. And for the loose sound, I used buzz error. For button sound list, I will just put coins in. The last thing that we have to do is to attach our buttons so they call the appropriate functions. So we drag game manager to our on, on click, go to game manager and add to player sequence list. And here we pass the index zero because it's the first button which has index zero. Then for orange, we do the same, but with index one. For green, same but with index 2. And for blue, same but with index 3. And only start button is left. We do the same dragging game manager, but we call different function called start game. At this point, the game should be ready. Let's check it out. We press the button. Something is wrong. Let's see what is exactly wrong. The buttons have states and there is a disabled state which we have on the button where it's, a, where it's not interactable so what we want to do we want to remove this graying out for disabled state for the buttons so they look like they're enabled do it by just switching color to white and increasing alpha to maximum. Let's try it again. So that was our game. So for your homework, try to make it six buttons. So the game will be more difficult. And feel free to share your result. Also, if you want more practice, I would suggest you to clone the game called Pong which is pretty easy and can be completed by passing my first two lessons. I will try to think about more games for you to practice so you learn faster. Please, if you like this video, put a thumbs up on it and subscribe to my channel. I will try to make more tutorials. And if you want to support me, you can buy me a coffee by the link in the description. See you in the next video.